The scripture reading is uh, from Luke chapter 24. It's going to be from verses 13 to 35. It could be found on your pew Bible, New Testament, page 84, if you'd like to follow along. It starts off with, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is said on the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as when the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophet has spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us? He talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, we are profoundly grateful for this gift that you speak to us. Give us, Lord, today the gift of hearing. Amen. Resurrection is tough material. It doesn't quite fit most of our categories. Jesus, in the next part of the evening story, he says to the disciples who've gathered in the upper room, he says, touch me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as I do. So we can cross off the list. Jesus is not Casper. He might be friendly, but he's not Casper. Resurrection's tough. It doesn't fit our categories, and for some, resurrection belongs in that same conceptual category as an egg-laying bunny rabbit or a calcium-crazed pixie. For others, resurrection conjures up memories of wishful thinking overly happy people who are ignorant of reality and rapidly squash the distort, uh, dissenting views of their distorted, almost magical world. We struggle with resurrection. The fact is, resurrection was given to people who did not expect it, who were not looking for it, and who did not, at first, believe even what they were experiencing. Jesus says to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. 
Later in the story, in the second half, the story part that we didn't read, he's meeting with his disciples, and it says, in their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. Resurrection was given to people who didn't expect it and didn't, even at the beginning, fully believe in it. Resurrection as well was given to people in their darkest night. Luke's version of the Easter Sunday morning story has angels asking the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? Because we're not looking for the living. We're looking for Jesus. You know he died a couple days ago? That's why we're here, to grieve. Little did they know. He lives. Resurrection is given to people who didn't expect it or believe in it. Resurrection was given to people in their darkest night. Which is why this series is called In the Night, My Hope Lives On. The title of the song as well is In the Night. This Wednesday, I ran on the treadmill for the first time in a very long time. Now, many of you know I had a surgery four weeks ago, and the cause of that surgery was something that really for most of the last year um, made it uncomfortable for me to do that kind of strenuous activity, to run or to play soccer at an adult level. I coached uh, my seven-year-old team last fall, but I could do that. Um, I'm grateful to finally have the surgery. I'm grateful to be on the comeback trail. On Wednesday, I ran one mile. In 10 minutes, I have a ways to go. I'm not going to win a Comeback Player of the Year award. I was down, but I'm not out. And we love stories like that, don't we? They are stories that, that hint at resurrection. And you know, it's my goal to get back in the position where at least on an occasional basis on a soccer field, I can surprise that 25-year-old and then brag to him that I'm almost twice his age. Because if you manage to pull it off, which doesn't happen a lot for me, but if you manage to, you might as well take advantage of it. We love those comeback stories. We love them because they hint at resurrection. And we love stories that hint at resurrection because we crave resurrection itself. We crave it like the Looney Tunes craved a drink from Michael Jordan's water bottle during halftime of the basketball game on the Space Jam movie. And if you saw the movie, Bugs Bunny grabs Jordan's water bottle, slaps a label on it, and writes Michael's secret stuff. And suddenly, everybody's got to have some because they're down, but they're not out to those monstar aliens who've stolen the powers of NBA players. It's a strange movie, but it's a lot of fun. And everybody's got to have some of it. They crave it, and we crave resurrection as much as we struggle with the concepts, as much as we struggle with the faith, as much as we struggle with our darkest nights. We crave resurrection. Now, when I planned this series theme, I, I, I knew Easter was coming. I didn't plan that myself. Um, but when I planned this theme of messages beginning today and continuing in the weeks to come, in the night, my hope lives on, I didn't realize how much I was going to be needing the message. Um, many of you know that in this last week on Monday, Robin's dad um, went on hospice care. And it is tough to watch. Um, and we love him very dearly. As often as I've been through this process with folks, there's still so much about it that I just simply don't understand and probably never will. I know, however, that I crave the story and the promise of resurrection. I crave it. Now the problem of receiving the story and the promise of resurrection is most of the time it's our perceptions. And, and we've got them hardwired in a certain direction aligned with our expectations of how things go and how the world is. And you see it happen for Jesus' disciples in these stories. Mary's in the, gar in the garden looking at the tomb and Jesus comes up behind her and talks to her and the first thing she's thinking is he's the gardener. 
until finally he calls her by name. Because she is not expecting this. In fact, her expectations are completely different. And we perceive the world around us through the lens of our expectations. The disciples on the Emmaus Road, they meet Jesus and they think he's, he's got to be from out of town. I mean, you're the only one around who hasn't heard what's happened in the past couple days? Well, what? Tell me about it, Jesus says. Now, the scripture tells us they were prevented from recognizing him. I wonder, though, how much of a role their expectations played in that prevention. Here in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 24, he offers us two resources to break through the barrier of our expectations and perceptions to help us perceive and recognize Jesus risen. They are word, scripture, and table, this table around which we gather today. In the church, the official label for our worship services, if you look it up in the hymnal, is a service of word and table. And Luke is very conscious in this chapter to place the recognition of Jesus within the context of the worship of the primitive church. Jesus greets the disciples, peace be with you in the upper room, a greeting that we still use today. This section, Luke 24, has two stories. In the first one, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, Jesus begins by meeting them and discussing Scripture. They finish seated at the table. In the second story, Jesus shows up in the upper room and he begins by gathering around the table with them. He eats fish and he finishes by discussing Scripture. Word and table, table and word break through our perceptive barrier and allow us to meet and recognize Jesus. What do those Emmaus Road disciples say? Were not our hearts burning within us while he was opening the scriptures to us? Word. There's an earlier story in Luke's gospel about Lazarus and a rich man. Lazarus being a beggar who ate scraps from the rich man's table. They're both dead. Lazarus is blessed in the bosom of Abraham and the rich man is in torment. And he looks up and he sees Lazarus and he says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, send somebody to my brothers to tell them what's going on so they can change their ways now and don't end up where I am. And Abraham responds, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Because it takes word and table to break through those perception barriers. Scripture's power is not so much that it is persuasive on its own, but it captures our imagination, and changes the way we perceive. So if you are struggling to receive the story and promise of resurrection, if you find yourself in that darkest of nights, if you find yourself just not expecting it and not at all ready for it, place yourself under the influence of Scripture and let it have its way with you. Word. And then there's table. Jesus is in the story recognized in the breaking of the bread. We're given these verbs in the story. Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives the bread when he sits at the table. The same four verbs that show up when Jesus feeds the multitude. The thousands that gather when he teaches. The same four words that show up when Jesus gathers with his disciples for his last supper at the table. What we do when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the words we use, the prayers that we pray, the things that we repeat, it's not so much mumbo-jumbo. It is ritual 